Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Live from New York City, hot New York City. It's burning up in the city now. This is Kastuba Das, and this is Wisdom of the Sages, your daily yoga podcast. Raghunath's not here with us today, but we have a special guest, Chaitanya Charan, the spiritual scientist, who we'll be speaking to very soon as our uh, interviewee. Mara, good morning to you. How are you doing? Good morning. I'm well. How are you? I'm doing good. Is it hot up there also? So hot. <laughs> okay. It just became summer overnight. Yeah, it did. It became the middle of summer overnight. Um, so, Mara, what's happening? Do we have some announcements for today before we get into the interview? We do. We have our Bhakti Recovery Group meeting is at 930. Um, okay. The Urban Davy Women's yeah. Group is meeting via the Bhakti Center. That's at 11.30 a.m. Is it 11.30 to 1? Is that how? Yeah, yeah I think, I think so. so. Yeah. And then for our Patreon members, uh, Yamuna Bihari is offering a Marma workshop today at 2 p.m. Okay. And he's also offering another workshop tomorrow evening called the Yoga of Eating, an Ayurvedic wow. perspective to food, and that'll be tomorrow night at 7 p.m. for Patreon members. That's the kind of yoga that people like, right? Yes. Yoga of eating. Bring it right I down to the most also. fundamental <laughs> aspects of life. I guess breathing is there too, but eating is important also. <laughs> okay, that's it for now? Yep. Thank you, Mara. So uh, everybody, today we have, uh, you know, a dear friend, a regular guest on the show. And, you know, it was a little while ago that Raghunath and I said, you know, Chaitanya Charan Prabhu, he's someone that we, we can't just have him every now and then. He's someone that we got to keep bringing back. He's got so much to offer. And, and he's prolific. Chaitanya Charan, is, he's a monk. Uh, a dear friend of ours who come, he's, comes out of the ashram of the Radha Gopinath Temple, which is where, you know, it's, it's a, a temple community led by Radha Swami in Mumbai. And, and it's where Raghunath and I, for, for decades now, it, it's been a real source for us, for friendship, for inspiration, and so on. And they have a, a large ashram of monks there. And Chaitanya Charan is one of the senior monks, but a brilliant person. He's a, a mentor and a spiritual author with a degree in electronics and telecommunications engineering. And he's a world traveler. He, he travels all over speaking at the world's top universities and companies, sharing his wisdom of the yoga tradition. He's the author of over 20 books. Um, and every day he writes and publishes a 300 word inspirational reflection on a verse from the Bhagavad Gita that's posted on his website, uh, gitadaily.com. And you can go there and find over 3,000. It's probably well over 3,000 of his Gita meditations. 5, he writes art. Yeah. How many? 5,000 now, actually. Oh, 5,000. Okay. <laughs> Impressive. <laughs> and um, his articles have been published in many of the important Indian newspapers, including the Indian Express, the Economic Times, and the Times of India in the Speaking Tree column. And that Speaking Tree column is like a really big thing in India. You see it all over. It's like a, it's a very um, well-known uh, column. He also, you can also visit his, visit his website, thespiritualscientist.com, where he answers questions by seekers. And there you're going to find many thousands of recorded videos and, uh, and hundreds of articles that he's written. And so, as I mentioned, he's a very prolific person, but he's, you know, he, he's a friend of mine, you know, on the heart level. I, I love having him here just as a friend. But um, it's amazing. Uh, he, he's an amazing thinker. And, he, and he, he takes the same books and philosophies that we've been reading for, for, for many years, and he has... You know, he applies his, his scientific or his engineering mind to them. And with this, he's able to really categorize and just, you know, sometimes it can be so, um, I don't know, revealing uh, when someone who's been studying the same thing that you're studying just frames it in a new way, in, in a really clear way, and, and everything starts to snap into place. And Chaitanya Charan Prabhu really has the ability to do that over and over again. So uh, we're, we're, we're really thrilled to have you back. Welcome back, Prabhu. Thank you, Prabhu. It's... I often hear your podcasts and the wisdom of the sages is going to go into the history of the bhakti movement as one of the <laughs> <laughs> one of the uh, you could say trendsetters in how to present uh, bhakti in a very appealing as well as faithful way appealing to the audience faithful to the tradition so it's always my honor and pleasure to be here with you that's very Thank generous you for of your you <laughs> Well, thank you. So, Prabhu, I want to start by bringing up the fact. I mentioned that you have over 20, you've, you've authored over 20 books, but how many is the total? 
ओके इट्स एक्चुअली एंड टू मोर आर गोइंग टू बी पब्लिश सून Okay so you oh. you you've published 26 books written and published 26 books but uh there are two that are just waiting in the pipe and they're about to come out um Yeah and, by this next week actually Oh by next week okay and these yeah. both of these books I don't know how he writes so many books <laughs> that's really <laughs> impressive but um uh these next two books are about the Bhagavad Gita correct Yes and what are they so, called Okay the Bhagavad Gita is uh, the book which I have connected with the most Hmm. So uh, I'm calling these two books as Relishing Bhagavad Gita and Bhagavad Gita Insights. Okay. Relishing so the, Relishing the, Bhagavad Gita and Bhagavad Gita Insights. These books are not yet published but they will be available very hmm. soon. Yeah, so they approach the Gita from you could say two distinct perspectives. We could say the the Bhagavad Gita uses the word mind and intelligence many times. Mai arpita mano buddhir. Mm-hmm. That offer your mind and your intelligence to me. Okay. so we could roughly equate the mind with the emotional faculty it's not a mm-hmm. very precise equivalent but uh, r- but roughly and the intelligence with the rational faculty okay so the relishing bhagavad gita approaches and studies the book from the emotional side we focus on how the bhagavad gita although it's a philosophical book it is actually uh, an expression of the loving relationship between krishna and arjuna Mm-hmm. so how their relationship is manifested developed and ultimately made more intimate by the end of the gita so that that is what i trace in relishing bhagavad gita very interesting and mm, and i just complete that and then we can discuss so and yeah. in bhagavad gita insights i'm approaching it more from a rational perspective so if somebody reads the gita there are many verses which can be striking but there are many verses which can also be challenging Uh, that mm. oh what does this mean how does this make sense so each uh, so the the bhagavad gita insights re- looks at some of the typical questions that may come up for a reader when they read the gita and i try to address them i see so each okay. of these books has about hun- has as exactly 100 articles and all of them i try to have some illustrations with them it is a 78 illustrations which convey the themes that i'm trying to share and so 100 reflections approaching the gita from the emotional perspective relational perspective we can say mm-hmm. krishna arjuna relation 100 from the rational perspective to understand its concepts fascinating and now now um the gita itself you know if we look at we're drawing from this broad tradition of you, you know it's a tradition of yoga or tradition of bhakti or we could call it vedanta you know it, it's a collection of of literature that goes back many many centuries composed in sanskrit handed down within the tradition it's believed that this wisdom has been handed down you know forever and, and uh but but even you know in in um in its literary uh written form it's certainly centuries old and it's vast right there's there's many 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 texts it's a tradition of many texts but of all of these texts in as far as i can see it seems that the bhagavad gita which is a mere 700 verses which is in one sense a relatively small uh text um seems to have stood out amongst them all as the most studied the most quoted the most um uh applicable or 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 the most um let's say practiced as i can see would you agree with that yes bro definitely i talk about broadly three stages in, in how the bhagavad gita has historically been uh, received and spread okay. so the bhagavad gita is no doubt a philosophical book it at the same time if now if you look at the bhagavatam or other books they are they are philosophical there are of course stories and other things in it but bhagavad gita is we could say philosophy in real life hmm. the setting is that krish arjuna has to face a very heart wrenching ethical dilemma that he he has to fight a war against people who are vicious wrong doers but supporting those wrong doers are also people are people who are very close to him whom he respects venerates so what does he do should he fight or should he not fight hmm. so so that, that that question which is presented as a as a very real human 
dilemma which faces us human beings what is the right thing to do hmm. so the bhagavad gita it's interesting krishna when arjuna asked the question to arjuna uh, krishna so what should i do pruchami tvam dharma sammudha cheta so he doesn't ask should i fight or should i not fight he doesn't ask also what is my dharma he just asks what is this dharma and here the word dharma means what is the right thing to do hmm. and that is a universal question so that universal question because the gita addresses that traditionally we could say in the medieval times uh, the gita became one of the three core books which every major tradition used to try to establish its philosophical base philosophical credentials mm mm-hmm. That so, was, that so, in a, so in other words, coming out of this broader Veda, tr- tradition of Vedanta, um, th- there's many different schools, and in order yes. to establish their validity, in a sense, they they comment on three books. Or... Yes. Okay. So the Vedanta Sutra is one of them. The Upanishads are another of them, and then the Bhagavad Gita is the third. Hmm. So that was one stage where the Gita was considered very important. especially in establishing a traditions philosophical credentials then after that when the west started interacting with india during the times of colonialism that was the time when the indian tradition seemed to be so vast and incomprehensible that the west wanted to see is there some book like the bible which is like the basis mm-hmm. and then that was the time when the bhagavad gita became very prominent in fact the among all the books in the indian tradition especially the spiritual literature the bhagavad gita is the most translated in english itself there are something like 900 translations mm. and there may 900 reasonably rec- well known translations so during that time the bhagavad gita became uh, like the prominent book in the west's eyes of what india's philosophical wisdom is sure mm. uh yeah and then third stage is where in india itself the bhagavad gita begins began to be seen as a book that embodies indian values and a book that is something which uh, represents india so the two stages are very similar but the west started seeing it as the primary book and in india also that same recognition came up so today for most people if they want to know about spiritual india uh, there are many books like the patanjali yoga sutra is there there are, there is of course the bhagavatam is now slowly becoming popular then there is also the for the story the story perspective there is ramayana and mahabharat mm-hmm. but the bhagavad gita if you want wisdom uh, philosophical wisdom about the in broad indian tradition then the bhagavad gita is the go to book now when you mention that uh, i suppose You, you th- that third um phase that you mentioned where it the bhagavad gita becomes popularized as a book that embodies indian values um mm. is, is, like is that even do you see that that that's it's promoted um by by important thinkers that way or even or like within the schools is that the idea and and, and i'm wondering um what are those values yeah that's a good question <laughs> see see what happens is that uh, the the idea of nation itself as we understand it now it was in nations were never understood earlier like that mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, i could go into a whole history about that but the point here is that as modern as in modern india got independence 1947 and before that also the idea that the bhagavad gita in my understanding has many values but the values which were relevant were especially the value of engaging with the world not just renouncing the world one of the thoughts that pervaded the indian mind was that india was subjected to foreign rule for many centuries because india turned to other worldy hmm? mm. and the bhagavad gita was seen as a book which engages encourages respons- responsible engagement with the world and another value is that india is a um, multilingual multicultural multireligious country and the bhagavad gita embodies those values is the krishna sind bhagavad gita mama vartamanu vartante manushya partha sarvashah that all people are on my path the gita doesn't say my way is the only way 
in fact as i said ultimately we are on all on one journey of consciousness mm. we're all trying to ex- learn more experience more and grow more i see we may all choose different ways but that so the gita says that is the path that it is describing so in that sense the inclusiveness of the gita mm. was also what uh, what was seen to be embodying the the broad values of india and on a world stage that's can be seen as unique yes definitely yeah okay interesting and and, and then you mentioned that this idea of responsible engagement with the world and, and maybe there it differs from a lot of the from the say upanishads or, or you know um a lot of the other spiritual thought in the east where it may have been a, the, the path may have been seen as more um secluded uh whereas in the gita yes. now we're finding like no engaging with the world as a yogi yes exactly so so if we see in the indian tradition there have been stages but uh, while the renounced aspect of life is important at the same time it was for a particular phase in life and for a particular group of people for uh, so for example see we humans in if we want to take it metaphorically you know we humans stand between the earth and the sky hmm? we are tiny but we stand between the earth and the sky so if we consider it as a spiritual evolution there are some people who are already so spiritually inclined or evolved that we could say their heads are already touching the sky so they have no that much interest in the world mm-hmm. so for them renouncing the world is a natural and desirable choice <laughs> yeah it's interesting because <laughs> like i think in india you meet people like that like in america i mean i'm sure there's people that kind of have a lot of that in them but it seems like when you go to india you'll meet like at least as myself as a person who grew up in the united states and then visited india you just i guess cuz it's just more in deep for centuries deeply embedded in 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 that culture that you do meet people that that can display unique amounts of um renunciation i suppose just naturally yes agreed yeah. it is true and of course i would say that maybe you also go to parts of india where people are more spiritually inclined to be yeah. fair about that yeah. but yes definitely i have seen that that is true so so for so but what happened was that started spreading to almost everyone mm-hmm. and the B- buddhism as it is practiced in the world today it is quite cool and it is quite popular and buddhism is quite world engaging but historically there was a phase when buddhism was in at least in indian history it was quite world rejecting Mm-hmm. and to some extent uh, the hindu tradition the vedic tradition also uh, took a similar turn for some time but then the bhagavad gita is a central book which actually focuses on world engagement and right. but it is the idea is that you can engage in the world with spiritual consciousness mm-hmm. so the whole thought flow and analysis of the gita is uh, what is it that actually gets attached what is it that gets entangled and how can we prevent that hmm. so that is the core message of the gita it is so gita says that it's not just action that entangles it is we could say emotion or attachment or intention it is motivation that entangles and if we change that then we will not get entangled in the world so that is what it talks about not renunciation of action but renunciation in action hmm. within action Right, right. It which seems at least as you read the Gita, it seems like it was a concept that at least to Arjuna, it seemed to be a very foreign concept. Like it took him some quite a few chapters to begin to for it to click in his mind. Yeah, that is true. What happens for him is he thinks in terms of polarities. Either I act or I renounce. Hmm. So because of that when Krishna brings in something as a, you know, if you consider a pendulum action entangles a re- a renunciation disentangles mm-hmm. but the problem with renunciation is he is also conscious of his responsibility in the world mm-hmm. so he said i can renounce the world but i will be failing in my responsibilities if i act i will be doing my responsibility while getting entangled mm-hmm. so if you consider there's two sides of a pendulum the balanced state is something which uh, it takes time for him to appreciate and krishna also talks about that balance at multiple levels how we can achieve that balance that's why there is karma yoga 
and then there is dhyana yoga and then there is bhakti yoga so all of these provide this so we could say the middle stage of the pendulum it krishna also talks about multiple levels in that hmm yeah, it's it's uh it's, it's, it's again i i love how you break things down and and looking at those two polarities and it seems that um a, a lot of wisdom may lie in recognizing polarity and i don't know maybe assuming but but or let's at least say investigating where there might be some synthesis uh between the two and and a deeper truth may lie there you know we're, we're right now uh on the podcast you know uh weekly we're we're at the point where um in the bhagavatam where indra comes and he steals the horse from mm. from prithu maharaj <laughs> right and so so we have a, a a king who's you know he's in one way taking on a, a very difficult task uh we can imagine at a, a great personal sacrifice to do good for his kingdom to do good for 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 the general population through this ritual and then you have uh indra who's like he's in a very high position um and uh and out of fear and you could say out of a selfish concern he goes and tries to intentionally disrupt that the the you know the well-intentioned um ritual of of prithu um just for an entirely selfish motive and the reactions coming from the sages the reaction coming from the priest from the the or, from the wise men from the religious orthodoxy everybody's saying punish him you know punish you know he deserves punishment and brahma comes and he begins to speak on another level and, and, and as you're saying he begins to see that life is complicated right like in other words it's there's a temptation to put everything in a polarity good or bad but throughout mahabharata and and as you mentioned right right at the beginning of the gita we deal with like a situation that's complicated and it becomes difficult to understand exactly how to apply principles yes agreed so one of the driving questions of the bhagavad gita is also the driving question of the mahabharat which is okay. a bigger book within which the bhagavad gita is spoken yes and that is what is dharma what is the right thing to do the bhagavatam of course takes this question and makes it could say more urgent more specific what is the right thing to do at the time of death mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but there is a natural development between the two and this question that what is the right thing to do it becomes especially perplexing when we face uh, ethical di dilemmas so there are we all can face different kinds of crossroads in life uh, now terms can vary but i try to differentiate between what we can call as a moral dilemma and a ethical dilemma a moral well, a, dilemma a modern yeah a moral 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 model, dilemma model. okay mo moral moral yes Mor morality so mm -hmm. so moral dilemma is basically where one choice is moral and the other choice is immoral okay so somebody is uh, maybe in a shopping mall and they see okay the camera here is broken maybe i can shoplift i can i can get away with it should okay. i should i not <laughs> right <laughs> so <laughs> opportunity is so, there the yeah, opportunity is there no mm -hmm. well, there is a cynical saying i don't agree with it she says most morality is just lack of opportunity okay <laughs> <laughs> i guess we can always test it when once the opportunity is offered that 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 theory becomes tested yeah yeah but the point is in such a situation should i do it or should not do it it just requires moral strength okay oh you know i won't be greedy i won't do it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that's moral strength required but ethical dilemmas are where there are two things and both of them are right in their own way okay so which is the more right thing or which is more right in this particular situation right so that is ethical dilemma where mm -hmm. there are two conflicting moral values and both uh, one has to we are, at that time one just doesn't just need moral strength in one sense one needs a moral framework Mm. or a philosophical world view with a moral framework that places moral values in a hierarchy that is this is this a higher morality over here or is this the higher morality over here and so the bhagavad gita is sometimes the bhagavad gita can seem for some people to be like a book of violence because it is spoken on a battlefield yeah but remarkably the gita doesn't refer to much to the war at all 
you know in one sense if uh, if krishna had wanted arjuna to just fight krishna could have just reminded arjuna of all the nasty things mm. that the opponents had done to his family mm-hmm. the opponents had even tried to dishonor and disrobe his wife in public yeah now that would have been enough for a warrior like arjuna to have his blood boiling and fight mm. but krishna doesn't even once mention that interesting because because krishna's purpose is not just to get arjuna to fight krishna's mm. purpose is to provide arjuna a framework for sound decision making mm-hmm. amidst ethical dilemmas very, so okay very yeah, interesting but, but, can you describe that framework for us okay in yeah greater detail so I, yeah just so but i just described the ethical dilemma that he was facing okay so uh, traditional words uh, that is arjuna is torn between two dharmas dharma is duty or the right thing to do okay so one is his kshatriya dharma kshatriya is means is a warrior so the warrior's duty is to protect society from wrong doers mm-hmm. protect society from aggressors uh, disruptors anti social elements basically and clearly if we read the broader context of the mahabharat the opponents the kauravas were law breakers mm-hmm. so that is his warrior duty was to punish aggressors but he also has a kula dharma kula dharma is dynastic duty that i am a part of a family of dynasty and their opponents are also my cousins they are my relatives they are my grandfather over there mm-hmm. so i have a duty to protect my dynasty so he is torn between his warrior duty and his dynastic duty mm-hmm. so which duty is important now of course the bhagavad gita doesn't get into these specific duties but it takes that forward that it takes the forward that okay uh that when um, somebody is torn between two duties when we there is a ethical dilemma how does one move forward so i try to talk about the gita in uh, we could say four four a uh, forward acronym you can say i start with the first uh, basis the gita gives for uh analyzing is identity so before we can decide what is the right thing to do we have to understand who we actually are hmm. so to understand who we actually are that is the gita says our identity is that we are spiritual beings so the gita talks about in one sense multiple levels of identity hmm. it doesn't deny our current identity say i am an indian most of you are americans uh, some of us are male some of us are females these are identities but we could say these are more functional identities Hmm? that okay. we might change our citizenship we might change we might identify as a profession we might change our profession so these are functional identities but below all functional social other such identities is our fundamental identity uh-huh. so that fundamental identity is that we are spiritual beings so krishna in one sense starts the gita uh, with an approach which is uh, similar to a well known quote of einstein he says that problems cannot be solved at the same level of awareness or consciousness that created them mm-hmm. so krishna says if you are only going to think am i a warrior or am i a you know should i do my warrior duty or should i do my dynastic duty functional that that, that uh, fun- both are functional yeah and how do how will you prioritize is this function more important this function more important this is go below the functional level to the fundamental level mm-hmm. so who am i really mm-hmm. that is identity so now once we get that identity right the the next thing that the gita brings in is divinity okay that divinity is that we all are parts of a reality a cosmic universal or transcosmic reality beyond ourselves so the the gita's vision of the divine is also very interesting the gita doesn't say that the that god just exists somewhere far away in some abode somewhere this is the gita's vision is that uh, we are inside god and god is inside us hmm. yomam pashyati sarvatra sarvam cha mai pashyati so what it means is that the whole of existence is non at one level non different from god in the in the gita the krishna also shows the universal form where all of the universe is the body of god 
so we are inside god and god is inside us because inside our hearts god exists in a manifestation of his divine called the paramatma the soul is the atma and the paramatma is the supreme soul or is called the super soul so the the implication of this is that we all are integrally parts of the divine mm-hmm. okay which so is also a question of identity but i guess it's it's going deeper into that fundamental identity exactly yes so okay. i i am spiritual being but i am not just a isolated fragmented spiritual being i am mm-hmm. a spiritual being who is a part of the supreme spiritual being mm-hmm. mm-hmm. now based on that so then what happens is the third thing the gita talks about is we could say energy we all have certain energy endeavor we all do endeavor but we do the endeavor with the energy so the energy that we have so i use this acronym idea i d e a okay so i talk about identity divinity and energy so our energy is best used in harmony with the divine because we all are parts of the divine so so i try to phrase this as be a part be not a part okay. so <laughs> so be a part we are a part of the divine so let's act as a part of the divine so the gita's vision is that now this when we talk about energy generally we use the word energy as uh, something which is potential which can do things mm-hmm. so our own conceptualization i have free will i have intelligence i have emotions i have all these energies but what am i meant to do with this so krishna tells arjuna that in going back to the specific situation that don't just think that oh are you going to protect uh, are you going to do your warrior duty or are you going to do your dynastic duty think what is the divine plan for the world what will be for the greater good hmm. and krishna says that it is my my plan to establish dharma establish the order of virtue establish that in the world and for that purpose the the those who are disruptors of dharma have to be removed have to be neutralized so our energy in one sense the bhagavad gita says is it just even in conception our energy means is to be utilized in harmony in a mood of service to the divine mm-hmm. and then that brings us to the last part that is activity which starts with an a yeah so idea i d e a so so activity the gita says that activity. that we, if we do it in a mood of service then we are not implicated for our actions okay. so even if somebody does something which is normally considered objectionable say if there is uh, normally even hurting any person is bad but if there is a group of criminals or terrorists running uh, running ri- wild in the city and then the police uh, neutralize them mm-hmm. and they risk their lives to do that then that is considered glorious the country will reward them if some uh, rogue state is attacking the borders and the military defends it so th- at this point the 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 soldiers are although they are acting individually they may be acting heroically but they are not acting whimsically they are not just killing because they dislike the opposite person mm-hmm. okay i think uh, they are a part oh. of something but that applies for everyone so when we act say for example we all are parts of units bigger than ourselves we may be part of a family we may be part of a community we may be part of a country so when we act in a mood of service to these greater units that we belong to and ultimately the greatest unit that we belong to is god so activity that is done in the mood of service that will never entangle us that will in fact elevate and ultimately liberate us so that is how so this krishna gives this framework of could say idea for us to uh, resolve our ethical dilemmas mm. so we could say that identity and divinity are fairly clear but okay how am i meant to use my energy so for that we need prayer we need uh, we need introspection mm-hmm. we may need consult with others and then how can i best serve in this situation if we have that attitude then we will get guidance about how to move ahead through our ethical dilemmas so 
in other words, where one may be concerned about the Gita's battlefield setting. And one might, you know, um, reasonably be concerned that it seems like an appeal to violence in the name of God. Um, that if one's going to actually engage with this fairly, you're going to see that there's that it's it's not such a um, simplistic kind of statement that's being made or, or, or encouragement that's being made. Really, this book is encouraging one to think very deeply about their own sense of identity um, and, and, and about how their their own sense of divinity and how um, what is their more fundamental role in the universe. It's, exactly. Okay. Definitely. See, violence is, uh, it's in one sense, in the core message of the Gita, it is remarkably absent. Mm. Because the Gita, as I said, I talk about, this is one of the, in fact, there are several articles talking about this theme of violence in my book. So I talk of it from one perspective is that, as I said, the Gita doesn't even use any of the circumstantial reasons for war. Although that would have been the easiest way to get to get Arjuna to mm. uh, act. So we can look at the content of the Gita. So I talk about the content, the context and the consequence. So the content perspective, if you see that there is hardly uh, any usage of uh, uh, war, uh, like w war fomenting, uh, violence fomenting kind of language. And if you look at Arjuna's question, at the start and Arjuna's answer at the end. In both cases, say Arjuna asks, what is, what, is, what is the right thing to do for me? What is dharma? Hmm. And at the end, and Arjuna doesn't say, I will fight. He says, I will do your will. I'll act Karishe. harmoniously. Yeah, yes, Karishe Vachnam Tava. So, in fact, in the end of the Gita, there is practically, last several concluding verses, there's no reference at all to war. So it's mm. about the messages of message of harmony. Of yeah, Arjuna says, "Yes, I will harmonize with your will. I will do your will." So that that, that is the essential message of the Gita. So in terms of the context, if we see what Arjuna asks and what Arjuna understands as the application of the Gita, it is a mes message of harmony. So, and then in terms of consequence, the Gita has been influential for thousands of years in India. Now. If you consider many of the prominent commentators who wrote on the Gita, there's Ramanacharya, Madhvacharya. In our tradition, we have had, in, we are a part of the Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition, where we have Vishwanachakra Thakur. The men, uh, and we have Baldi Vidya Bhushan. Many of these commentators, they were living at a time when India was under quite aggressive and iconoclastic Islamic rule. Mm -hmm. A lot of temples were desecrated, a lot of... Uh, uh, a lot of the uh, fodder for a lot of, uh, rebellion and uh, yeah, uh, like that, so revolution. And these achar these acharyas were all trying to share the spiritual wisdom and establish spiritual culture, which was being ravaged in front of their eyes. But in not one of their commentaries does any of the acharyas say that. Therefore, the conclusion of the Gita is now all of you should rise and fight against these aggressors. Mm, interesting point. So not one of the traditional commentators even once mentions this. Hmm. So in terms of consequence, so that's why in the content, context and consequence, the Gita has never been used as a book for uh, for fomenting violence against anyone. So the, it's, it's just so I, the, the Gita, you could say that there is, you know, there is, if you are going to go back to the pendulum and polarities, yeah. there is, there, there could be silence, there could be violence. Hmm. But the Gita's message is neither silence nor violence, but transcendence. It's interesting because <laughs> now just, it's a fascinating breakdown that you have there. Um, I never considered it uh, so deeply. Um, but thinking now, there are certain places in the Gita where Krishna actually encourages Arjuna to fight. Right, Like at the end of the third chapter, we find it. We'll find it also in the eighth chapter. Um, and I'm, I'd imagine other places too, but I, I'm thinking of both of those contexts. It's, although he is saying fight, it's almost more really what he's asking him to do is to have a certain state of consciousness. It's almost assumed that he's going to fight. He's asking him to come to a certain yogic state of consciousness as he carries out his duty. 
Like that's more where the message is going, right? Like in the third chapter where he's saying, you know, all, he says, you know, armed with yoga, stand and fight. But it's in the context yes. of his conquering his, his lower nature, um, his, his lower desires that he was saying, stand and fight. And in the eighth yes. chapter. You know, that's yeah. A, yeah. Yeah. If you just, mind, I'm just saying. So I have an article on this topic itself. See, mm. this is 441 and 442. Krishna tells Arjuna to fight. Yeah. So, Tasmad Agyana Sambhutam, Ritstam Gyana Sinatmana, Chitvainam Samshami Yogam, so it's interesting what Krishna tells him to do is, therefore arise and fight. But he's telling him fight with what? Fight with a sword. Now, Arjuna is not a sword fighter. Arjuna is a, he usually fights with bow and arrow. Uh, bow, bow and arrow. So that is significant. And not only that, he's telling him fight against what? The smart agyana sambhutam ritstam gyana sinatma. Fight with the sword, Gyan Asin. Fight the sword of knowledge against the ignorance in your heart. Hmm. So, what the Gita is telling is that the inner fight is actually far more important than the outer fight. That, in fact, if you go a little earlier, uh, one, of my fav one of my favorite sections in the Gita is 336 to 43, where Krishna is asked by Arjuna, what is it that makes us act against our best interests? What is it that makes us act self-destructively? And Krishna identifies that self-destructive uh, urge by the name Kama, which you can call, can call as lust, but broadly it is, it is selfishness, it's self-centeredness. Mm -hmm. right? But the point is, Krishna tells Arjuna that this is your enemy in the world. Kamesha, Krodesha, mm -hmm. Rajoguna, Samudba, Mahakshano, Mahapapma, Vidhi, Enam, Yavairinam. In this world, this is your enemy. So we could visualize the Gita setting. Krishna and mm -hmm. Arjuna are there <laughs> right. on, the, on the middle of the bat in the middle of the battlefield. There are thousands of forces on both sides. And Krishna is telling Arjuna, he's not pointing to any of the enemies on the opposite. They are your enemies. He said, no, this, this craving, this urge for self-destructive indulgence, that is your enemy in the world. Mm. And that is the enemy you need to conquer. So the Gita emphasizes the inner war against our own lower nature, against our own self-destructive urges. Mm. That is far more emphasized in the Gita. And in fact, wherever the war imagery or war terminology is used, it is always in context with a, either the combination of the inner and outer war or even more uh, in the com context of the inner war. Mm. So now, how does this inner war and outer war relate? So the Gita's message here is that so there are some people, see, in one sense, lust, anger, greed, the Gita calls these as three gates to hell. And it is, uh, it is actually, if you look at most of the crimes in the world today, we can trace them down to these three things. Lust is related to all the sexual offenses and crimes. Greed is related with uh, most of the corruption and everything that goes on with capital, when it, capitalism goes wild or even communism in its own way. And the, those in power take, uh, those in power become arrogant and possessive. So, and then, of course, anger leads to all kinds of uh, violence, even when just small things become explosive. Mm -hmm. So most of the crimes we can trace to lust, anger, greed. So it's not just that lust, anger, greed take one to hell, some other hell. They in one sense bring hell into this world. They, make, mm -hmm. they can make our world hellish. So the Gita's vision is that each of us has to fight against these. Mm -hmm. And that is what every responsible person needs to do. In fact, fighting against these self-destructive cravings within us, uh, that is our primary responsibility. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, some people stop fighting against these and start fighting for these. That means some people start working, they use their intelligence, they use their energy, they use all their resources to fulfill their greed, mm -hmm. to fulfill their lust. And such people, so we could call them as psychopaths, some people just get pleasure in causing pain to others. They are very perverse mentality. So such people need to be forcefully stopped. So though so we, the Gita's core message is 
to encourage all of humanity to fight the inner war against our lower desires by activating our higher nature mm mm-hmm. but for those people who are not ready to fight this war well there are ways to regulate them in society that's what government is for but for those who are actively fighting for these inner forces then they are a menace to society mm-hmm. and so krishna is helping arjuna reenvision the war this is not just a war against your relatives this is not just a war for some kingdom this is not just you're fighting against your relatives actually you are fighting against those who have become enemies of the world because they have they have started fighting for their for the self destructive forces within them so such people do need to be stopped so that's how the inner war and the outer war yeah. can be correlated Very the far more yeah so far, just to conclude this so yes. the far more universal message is about the inner war that's what right. is universal for everyone but specifically in the context fighting the inner war uh, for society for in society for people to fight the inner war sometimes an outer war has to be fought against some people who have uh, who have you could say become instruments for their lust anger greed so again <clears throat> here's an example of <clears throat> uh finding a synthesis you know not not swing to either end of the polarity because some commentators i believe gandhi mentioned that like if the battlefield setting of the gita refers to a real battle then i'm not interested in it or something like that right although he, he although yeah. he drew very deeply from the gita um it seems like he was prone to say that the that the um the setting was entirely allegorical or, or something like that yes um, where where what you're saying is it's not that it's entirely allegorical but the battle that's being spoken about if you go deeper into this book you're going to find it's it's a it's a very different battle that it's that is its, its emphasis yes exactly so the challenge that has come over here is that the that i talk about three things you know you you read a book you read from a book and you read into a book hmm? say that again okay read a book <laughs> read a book read a book read fr- from a book mm-hmm. and read into a book okay so okay read a book means okay i just want to know what this book is saying but then read from a book means okay this is the section of the book i found find very inspiring very relevant i'll focus on that i'll read more and this is what i want to apply in my life this is what i want to share so first and second are perfectly fine they're they're desirable that's what we, we can't keep all the book in mind right uh, all the time but read into a book means what we have our own preconceptions and we impose those on the book mm-hmm. so and what that, happens with yeah. so unfortunately you could say yeah you can you can say what you're saying well Please. as and say that's not it's not uncommon that that's been done in gita commentaries oh yeah exactly mm-hmm. so shila prabhupad he wrote a, a gita commentary which he called uh, as bhagavad gita as it is mm-hmm. now that is sometimes that can sound like a Uh, like a presumptuous title mm-hmm. as it is that but his point was that the gita has very clear conclusions right. see the gita is very inclusive in its message mm? it is very broad different people they can read different things from the gita and that is fine but the gita is very clear in its conclusion when prabhupada said bhagavad gita as it is he was focusing that he is giving the conclusion of the gita very clearly mm-hmm. in fact not only clearly he gives it consistently throughout the book right mm? Mm, prabhupada doesn't get in his gita commentary he doesn't get so much into the technicalities of the gita and its various analysis of this level and that level he does address it but not too much he's focusing on the conclusion but mm-hmm. prabhupad would say that some gita commentaries are not bhagavad gita as it is they are bhagavad gita as you want it to be or bhagavad okay. gita as you are <laughs> as you so are. <laughs> so that's reading into it yeah Yep. So with all due respects to Gandhi ji I used to read his I, I read his several of his books before I was introduced to bhakti I read his gita commentary also So what happened was he was already a you could say a fan or a proponent of non violence Yeah and then he read that into the gita mm-hmm. And in fact uh, although he he ha- he is a extraordinary person in his own way he writes in his introduction that I would like to say that humbly submit that Vyasadev has committed a serious mistake. 
Mm. Vyasadev is the person who put the put the Vedic scriptures in writing. He said that he has used the the war as an allegory, as a metaphor. But this is a metaphor that is very likely to be misunderstood and misapplied. Mm. So I feel that he shouldn't have used this metaphor. Right. So it, it's it's you may say he's humble, but it's quite presumptuous to think. That, so he didn't consider that maybe there's some other some reason why he used that metaphor. So, yeah. Very interesting. Well, yeah. Into the, I, you know, I I feel, you know, as and I think we've discussed this with you on some previous uh, uh, the previous times you've been on the show. But it it does feel that um, you know, in the past decade or so, the polarity has increased a lot. You know, politically and in the social discourse. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's my own impression is that I think I see people of different. Uh, political bents reading into spiritual literature more than I've, I've ever noticed before. <laughs> you know, like the, the the tendency to read into the book it, it seems to be um, popping up all over the place. I don't know if you f- feel similar. Yes, that is very true. What has happened is that you could say there's a difference between ideas and ideologies. Mm-hmm. So people have ideas, ideologies have people. So now uh, ideology is not a bad thing, but if you have an ideology which reduces the world view of a person, mm-hmm. see, whatever intellectual tools we have, they are meant to help us understand reality. But the temptation is that once we acquire an intellectual tool, we reduce reality to fit into that intellectual tool. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And although the Bhagavad Gita itself, in one sense, you can say it's an intellectual tool, but the Bhagavad Gita says that many places, ultimately, reality is irreducible. It's far more complex than what we can understand. Yeah. Krishna says the way karma works is very difficult to understand. Gana karma no gati, how actions and reactions correlate. Krishna says his own nature, his divine nature, his glory is unlimited. Those are very difficult to understand. So the Gita provides us a philosophy, but it also focuses on humility. That, see, uh, but what happens for some people when they they are certain about something. This is how it is. Mm. And then, after that, they just, once they are certain that this is how it is, everything is reduced to their particular worldview. Mm-hmm. So, what is that saying that if somebody has a hammer, the whole world appears to be like nails. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, want to, something to hammer. So we try to so so that's now some in, because you could say that there is some amount of spiritual resurgence in the world. At least people are becoming more and more open to spirituality. So if somebody can quote from a spiritual text to support their ideas, then they get a little more credibility. Mm-hmm. So that's what people are doing. And yes, in the Gita, just to talk about this in the Gita, the Gita says that it is. Uh, important that we avoid the temptation to find faults. Aversion to fault finding is a virtue, a paishunam. So with respect to the problems of the world, this is something which I find quite, you could say either uh, funny or tragic. And if you ask people, you know, what is the problem? What is the actual problem? Okay, you know, why is there a, why is there a war between Ukraine and Russia? Or why is the inflation increasing so much? Or why is there poverty in the world? Why is there climate change? Now, most people may not be able to very clearly explain what the problem is. But those very people are very certain who is the cause of the problem. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, this, this evil capitalist, this evil dictator, this evil... So, <laughs> so what happens yeah. is that... It seems almost within the human psyche, uh, this is the conditioned human psyche, there is a need to find a villain. Mm-hmm. There is a need to find a villain. So, what happens? And it works both ways. If there is a villain, I can be a hero who is, right. who is gloriously fighting with that villain. And if I cannot be a hero, if I am in trouble, then at least I can get to play the victim. <laughs> and I can gar- <laughs> give me a, give me a role give me a good role one way or another <laughs> so that temptation to find a villain 
the bhagavad gita is so remark krishna doesn't just tell that avoid avoid finding faults avoid looking for a villain it doesn't just say that it teaches that because mm. the gita throughout doesn't point to the opponents as the villain so right. that's why this polar what you're talking about the polarization that is there in the today's world it is all rather than addressing issues we just want to find villains and blame villains mm. and we can avoid that uh, if we actually understand the mood of the gita and its message also we we're, we're almost out of time but even earlier this week on our show we we're discussing you know there, there's a term that's become popularized recently gaslighting you're probably familiar with it yes right and it's it's you know it certainly is it's a concern that people can be manipulative in how they particularly with people that they have an influence over and and um rather than deal with a real important issue uh you encourage a person to think that it's their own fault or something like that um and i see the political discourse or the social discourse seeping into the spiritual discourse and ideas like gaslighting being applied but factually you know the, the the sacred text of all these spiritual traditions they encourage us to introspect right it, it's it's an mm. a very essential part of spirituality <laughs> is to look within oneself and, and and to recognize the movements of the world in, in one sense to relativize them um and and to and to see them as impetus to look within mm. uh, and, true and, definitely and so if um if we're quick to apply these kind of concepts to spirituality without going deeper and, and that's what i like so much about what you've shared with us today like taking one concept um resisting the urge to immediately categorize it according to our you know our our um our psychological or, or intellectual tendencies and 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 rather than read into the text um go very deep into try to understand the different layers of of wisdom that's there um then it's only then that we're actually getting to transformation and it's transformation is what's actually needed to solve all these problems you know yes definitely you know, just i'll make two quick points this Please. very the gita talks about a very fascinating concept called knowledge in the mode of ignorance mm -hmm. so normally we consider knowledge and ignorance as opposite things But in 1822, it says "Yatto Krutsnava Dekasmin Kariye Sakta Mahetukam Atatwartha Vadalpamche Tat Tamasamudharatam." It says that when one takes one part of reality and makes mm -hmm. it the total reality, mm -hmm. then what happens is that person is having knowledge, but that knowledge is not removing their ignorance. That knowledge is reinforcing their ignorance. Mm -hmm. So if mm -hmm. I am biased against someone. then the news may talk about new in the news there may be how oh that community is good also they do so many good things but i will zero in on the news about how that community is bad and i will have 100 examples of all that that community did bad mm -hmm. so i have knowledge but that knowledge is only reinforcing my bias mm -hmm. so knowledge in ignorance means knowledge that increases our ignorance it doesn't decrease our ignorance <laughs> and because we live in a world where there's so such accessibility to knowledge now maybe we're becoming more ignorant yeah. than ever before <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's that what in social media they call events like echo chamber a social media yeah. bubble people yeah. live inside that itself and this actually applies even in religious traditions i'll conclude with this mm -hmm. is some people equate faith with certainty mm -hmm. if i have faith in god that i am certain this is right and everything else is wrong i was in texas once and i was everybody was taking me for a program and i was then in front of that our car we said you know uh, it's obviously belong to some evangelical christian he said that, no no disrespect to christianity but just mm -hmm. says god said it i accept it that settles it <laughs> <There you go. laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so no uh, need to look is, more deeply into this <laughs> so but then what happens with this is the problem with this is that life is complex and mm -hmm. god has said 100 things which particular thing to apply where right so 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 p some people equate faith with certainty but sometimes that certainty is not an expression of faith it is an expression of ego mm. uh, i am right and you are wrong right and in contrast these people sometimes equate uncertainty with lack of faith uh -huh. but uncertainty can be a sign of humility mm -hmm. 
that reality is far more complex than what i un- can immediately understand even what i the the books of wisdom that i am referring to they are also complex so therefore faith can sometimes uh, be better expressed through humility than certainty mm-hmm. yes there are certain bedrock truths there are some bedrock truths of which we are certain that the existence of god the existence of soul the pursuit of spirituality as life's primary purpose these are there but with respect to many specific issues in the world now if we approach them with greater humility rather than greater certainty we could avoid much more conflict and we could help create a better world sage advice from the spiritual scientists thank you so much uh for coming on again it, it's everything you say so but you got to you have unlimited things like this to share to find more please visit the spiritual scientist.com or also get to daily.com uh, i i recommend people check in every day get a little something from it it'll it'll um it'll really deepen your insight thank you for so much for coming on again thank you happy to be your side with you